about it. Here we are, I'm gonna ping. Hi everybody, welcome. My name is Eddie Chavez Calderon. Um, here with campaign director of Ariel Aesthetic. So excited to be with all of you today, um, having a great time for Torah. And today is a, a great day of learning for us today, but it is a day for learning tomorrow that's happening uh, on, on the other side of the world for us. And we're so excited to have Rabbi Nomi Kaltman here with us, who is from Melbourne, Australia. She holds a Bachelor of Laws and a Bachelor of Arts in po Politics and Jewish Civilizations from Manash uh, University, as well as her master's degree of legal practice from the Australian National University. Nomi is an uh, experienced writer. She is an Australia correspondent at Tablet Magazine in New York City and has a monthly piece uh, at Plus 61J Media. Her bylands have appeared in major publications, including the Cricket Media, uh, Mama Mia, The Forward, Religion and Politics, Neos, Cosmos, Religion Unplugged, the ABC, the age, and we can continue to go on. Um, previously, Noma, Nomi has worked for the Shadow Attorney General of Australia and the Victorian Legislative Assembly. Nomi coordinated and accompanied the parliamentary delegation to Israel and Palestine territories. She is in very involved in interfaith work, including sitting as a representative of the Faith Community Council of Victoria. We can continue to go on and share about the amazing, amazing attributes of Rabbi Nomi. Rabbi Nomi, I know personally for me, I have loved uh, Devar Torah, Rabbi Nomi, that you gave on high holidays, and the importance of time and how you really reflected on us taking time and, and uh, living in, in the present. I think you talked about your childhood um, and that, that was a, a real, real blessing for me to, to read. And I'm so excited to have you teach with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Eddie. Um, as you said, it's the future here in Australia. So good morning. It's 9 a.m. on Wednesday. The weather's good. It's the winter because we have opposite seasons. But it's really exciting to teach Torah and be here um, with my American friends and a few Australians, I'm sure, as well. Um, today, I'm going to talk about something that's very interesting that's happening in Australia, but perhaps is less well known in the world. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a slideshow that I want to share. Here we go. OK, everyone see it? We're good? Yes. Great. So right now, Australia is in the middle of a huge national debate. What's the debate about? We are deciding right now as we speak, a huge debate is raging. Should Australia add an indigenous voice to our constitution? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to think about it. When you think of Australia, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Sit, think about it. I'm sure if I ask some of you, um, well, I got a little, I got a personal DM that said crocodiles. Very good. That's one of them. Yes. Some people would say nine of the 10 most deadliest snakes um, in the world, in our lovely continent and country. Other people might think of super cute koalas, beautiful little kangaroos and joeys. And here's a nice little illustration. You think about exotic flora, our exotic fauna. Australia is kind of separate from the rest of the world. So we have unique plants and species that aren't found anywhere else. But when I think of Australia, and perhaps some of you do as well, I think of this. I think of our First Nations people, the Aboriginal Australians who have always lived in this country and have the oldest continuous operating culture, one of the con con oldest continuous operating cultures in the entire world. So they have unique languages, they have unique uh, customs, traditions, um, and a deep um, connection to the land. But being an Aboriginal Australian, or as they call themselves, Indigenous people to the country, hasn't always been a simple experience. If you don't know too much about Australia other than our beautiful flora and fauna, I think that mm, it, it, it can be a complicated story. We live in Australia in one of the most richest and most successful countries in the world. If you ever come here, I've had friends that come here and like, everything in your country is just 
works. I was like, I know, it's good. You have socialized health care. You have um, minimum sort of welfare for people who are poor and sick. You have really high quality um, produce, nutrition. You have really amazing hospitals that don't cost you anything when you go to them. Um, beautiful beaches, landscapes. This is a, a wonderful and plentiful country and it's multicultural. You come here with, um, with your culture from wherever you are in the world and we want to absorb that and incorporate that so that everyone learns from it. So I live in Melbourne. It's one of the most popular cities in the country. Beautiful life. I have kids. They go to school. I haven't ever experienced any anti-Semitism. I love where I live. I love everything about this country on my dad's side of the family they're holocaust survivors so they came after the holocaust after the absolute tragedy the jewish people experienced and they came to australia and so many of them came to australia because its reputation as a beautiful welcoming country that can make space for everyone with their culture and their religion was known but then you have a problem within this beautiful ecosystem that we live in what's the problem the problem is that the First Nations people, the Indigenous Australians who have been here since before European colonization and settlement, they don't live like the rest of majority of Australians. If you're Aboriginal in Australia, you can expect to live 10 years less than other Australians. And I need you to think about that for a second. This is one of the richest, most welcoming and successful countries in the world but yet if you're a first nations person you are going to experience an alternative reality reality that is going to severely disadvantage you in comparison to other australians almost half of aboriginal men and over a third of aboriginal australian women die before they turn 45 australia has one of the best life expectancies in the world australia has excellent health care which anyone can access free of charge I had all my babies in the public hospital and I remember speaking with an American friend and I said yeah you go into the hospital you have your baby and you come home and she goes and how much did you pay I said what do you mean how much did I pay we have private hospitals here you can pay to go to a hospital if you want but I went to a public hospital and she goes and how was the care I said the care was excellent it was amazing they took care of me they took care of my babies I came home I didn't get a hugely long stay in the hospital, but three nights to recover. And I came home and I said, no, so how much was that? I said, nothing. It doesn't cost anything for healthcare in this country. You pay a lot of taxes and you have other things, but it's a good life. But if you're Aboriginal, I need you to think about that. There is enough healthcare. We have enough trained doctors and we have enough people that could treat Aboriginal people. There's no shortage of doctors. The problem is, is that Aboriginal communities are underserved. They're in regional and remote areas and they have all these adverse effects because they don't get to experience so many of the luxuries that Australian communities receive. So you're going to live 10 years less if you're Aboriginal and you're born in this country. You have a much higher chance if you're an Aboriginal man of dying at 45 or a third of women are going to die before 45 years of age. And then what have we got as well? We have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person are four times more likely to wait more than one year for cataract surgery. I need you to think about that. In a system where you have socialised medicine like Australia, if you need a cataract, you call up the hospital with a referral from your doctor. They say, okay, if you want to go through the public hospital, which majority of people do, there could be a little bit of a waiting list, but if you have cataracts and you can't see, they'll get you on to a surgery. What is it, a half an hour surgery? An hour? Go into the hospital, very simple. They use lasers, they have the trained doctors. You'll go home, you'll recover for 10 days and you'll be able to see again. So you might wait a few weeks, but if you're Aboriginal, you're gonna wait four times longer. Can you think about what it's like not to have eyesight? You can't see, you can't work can't be involved in raising your children, caring for elderly people. What an awful situation that this is happening. And it would be an awful situation if it was happening anywhere in the world. But it's especially shameful that in one of the most richest and prosperous countries in the world, this is the reality of our First Nations people. 
How awful, how horrible. And why is it like this? Well, I guess it goes back to a few things. Number one, Australia has a complicated history with its indigenous people. When the first settlers arrived and colonized Australia from England, they declared a legal um, term, terra nullius. What does that mean? It means this land is empty. There was no people here. There were no people here. There was no culture. There was no system of law. We own the land now. It's ours. And that's not true. There are Aboriginal people. But from the outset, Australians who colonized and settled here decided, no, this is a land that is not, we're not going to acknowledge the first people. And there were massacres of Indigenous people. There was a history of uh, mistreatment of Indigenous people. Australia now in the 21st century is just starting to grapple with the complicated history that we have uh, for many decades. We would remove Aboriginal children from their families and place them with uh, white families or families that we thought were better for them. But this is a very ancient hunter-gatherer society and culture. You live together in groups, your families, intergenerational families. You learn how to fish. You learn how to prepare food. You learn your culture. You learn your language. And all of a sudden, you have white colonizers coming here, taking over the land, pretending you as a people and a culture never existed, have no intrinsic connection to the land. You massacre many of the tribal elders. You remove the children from the families. And this all happened in the late 1700s, 1770, I think it was, when Australians arrived. And what happens? 250 years approximately later, we still have systemic issues in the Aboriginal community. And the Aboriginal community in Australia continues to suffer. These small statistics are just a handful of some of the uh, challenges that Aboriginal Australians face in our country. So what to do? Because in Australia, the government has put a lot of money towards trying to help these remote communities. And it's an interesting, and I guess unfortunate situation. You try to put money, billions of dollars goes to Aboriginal health programs, Aboriginal programs to help them with addiction, uh, Aboriginal youth programs to um, try and reduce recidivism and people who go to jail before their time or continuously get put in jail. And despite billions of dollars spent on these communities, they're still in poverty, mired in disadvantage, intergenerational problems continue to compound. And not much, despite billions of dollars, is there to show that, that demonstrates that any of Australia's policies have been successful in helping Indigenous communities. And that's a really big shame. So in Australia, we have a constitution and our constitution has um, different rules about how you can change it. The, we don't have, when you change Australia's constitution, you have a vote and the vote has to satisfy two criteria. It has to say, number one, a majority of Australians say, yes, we want to change the constitution. But Australia has got a unique problem. Most of the population live along the coast in the cities that are more populous. So I live in Melbourne. It's at the bottom of the country. Sydney is very well known. Queensland, majority of the population live along the coast. Middle of Australia is not super populated or inhabited. You have Western Australia, South Australia, but because there are bigger and smaller states, but a majority of people live in Melbourne and Sydney, in order to ensure that any change to the constitution is representative of all people in the country, you have to not only have a majority of people in the country voting for a change to the constitution, because that could just be people in Melbourne and Sydney who are the majority. You also have to satisfy something called a double majority. 
a majority of people in Australia plus a majority of people in every single state and territory. And that's quite a high bar because in some of the smaller states where there's under a million people, you still need to capture a majority of people to make sure it is really representative of what the people want. Australia has a checkered history with referendum changing the constitution. Generally, they're not super successful. In our history, the most successful referendum that had the highest number of votes was the 1967 referendum to recognise that um, Indigenous people were, were Australian because we had this, um, we had this uh, concept of terra nullius, that, that there was uh, nothing in the land. So we, checked, we, we decided, no, actually, Indigenous people should be recognised because up to 1967, they didn't get to vote. They didn't get to participate in civic society because if the land was empty, then they don't exist in a legal sense. So the most successful ever referendum in Australia was in 1967. And it's interesting because Aboriginal people that I have met with, spoken to, been involved with, explained that they feel a deep kinship with the Jewish people because 1967 was a seminal year for Jewish people as well, in that that is when we regained access to Jerusalem um, as a people. And so Jewish people and Aboriginal people share a deep kinship, not just because in Australia many of the lawsuits that have been filed to help advance the rights of Aboriginal people have been run by Jewish lawyers or um, connections, people within the Jewish community who have advocated very strongly for Indigenous rights, but because we have a lot of um, similar, similarity and commonality. We're both cultures that are intrinsically linked to the land. We have ancient old traditions and not everything obviously is the same between Jewish and Indigenous people, but we share a deep kinship. So 1967, we have one of the most successful referendum in Australia's history. Should we add, should we recognise Indigenous people and should we reverse this concept of terra nullius? And yes, say the majority of Australians across the country and a majority of Australians in every single state and territory. Right now, it's a little bit more complicated. We, most other referendum that we hold in Australia fail, but the current referendum, which we don't have a date yet, proposes the following. Should we add a line to our constitution that says Indigenous people, should we say that they, they should have a voice to parliament and should that be enshrined in our constitution? Why, what does it mean? What does it mean? It means the following. The government is spending in Australia billions of dollars on Indigenous relief programs. They're throwing money at a problem, but the problem is compounded. The problem is getting worse. Things are not getting better. If anything, the results are sliding back for this community, which is very vulnerable. So in um, 2017, there was a conference of all Indigenous people from around Australia. It was the most proportionally representative conference. And they all got together and it was called the Uluru Statement from Heart. Uluru, in case you don't know, is the big rock in the middle of Australia. Very sacred for Indigenous people. And after decades of them asking us, can you please not climb on our sacred site? <laughs> in the last few years, Australia finally well, as they say, got with the program and banned people from climbing this sacred rock. But Uluru is um, a very important place for Aboriginals. So they had this conference. And at this conference, with all the different representatives of all the different Indigenous groups from around Australia, they said the following. As Indigenous people, we would like to be able to have input into policies and things that you want to do for our community. At the moment, the parliament sits in Canberra, the equivalent of our Washington, D.C. And you have generally, it's about 151 members of the parliament from across the country representing all the different states. Usually there's a few Indigenous people who, who get elected from um, the territories or states that have high Indigenous populations, so maybe the Northern Territory or from Western Australia. And you usually do have an Indigenous a Minister for Indigenous Affairs. But by and large, you have a whole bunch of people who live where I live, 
in the city on the coast. We, I don't see Aboriginal people on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't live in my suburbs. I don't live in a, you know, a rural area of Australia. Aboriginal people live on country. They live in the middle of the desert. They have these ancient hunting and gathering techniques where they can survive while I would just crisp and die. And I don't see them. They don't see me. But if I got elected to parliament, I would sit in the parliament and I'd say, you know what? We have to help Indigenous people. And I would say, you know what? I think we should help them by doing this and chuck money at some sort of program. But Aboriginal people are sitting in their regional area and they say the parliament is very detached from our reality. You have all these city slickers, people who don't know what our day-to-day -day and lived experience is like, people who don't know what we need in order to thrive and survive. They're chucking money at our communities, nothing's helping. You know what? We want that if the parliament is going to pass a law that is going to affect our communities, we want input and we want to be able to advise them. So if you want to send $100 million for a program to our, to our area, we'll tell you, actually, the way you're proposing to do it wouldn't help us. Actually, the way that you're proposing to implement it wouldn't be successful. Here's why. You've missed some cultural components. Now, this idea of an Indigenous voice to Parliament is not new. At different points in Australia's history, you've had Indigenous representative groups that have been elected or set up on different committees that come to the parliament to advise. Now, the problem with that model is that depending on who's in government and depending on who's elected, well, it can be a little bit discretionary whether they want to keep the old body. So we've had bodies abolished, Indigenous referral bodies. We've had bodies that were funded for a you know small period of time and then the next government gets gets elected and goes nah we don't want to fund it so they cut funding so they can't do anything we've had different models which have an indigenous voice but at each time they haven't been able to maintain either due to lack of funding changing government or a lack of agreement about how to implement these proposed changes so the Aboriginal community got together, Uluru Statement from Heart, 2017, they said, we have sat, we've held the council, this is the most proportionally representative body of any Indigenous groups in Australia's history. We want a voice to Parliament and we don't want more money to set up a body that the next government can come and the next government can, and can abolish. We want to be in the Constitution because it's in the Constitution, it will be protected. And if it's protected, you can't get rid of it. You have to listen to us. You have to actually take our voice into account. So that's what's happening right now in Australia. Should Australia have an Indigenous voice to Parliament? Now, this is something that many people may not know, but Australia is one of a handful of countries in the world that has compulsory voting. Any vote in our parliament, any vote that we have is compulsory. You have to you have to participate. We have relatively, even if you don't participate, you get a fine. And whenever I've told Americans this, they said, what? That's wild. That's crazy. I said, yeah, it is on some way. Um, I'm, I've just got a comment here from, oh, Fred Morgan, you're Australian. You're a rabbi. I know you. Hello. Um, he said, he sent me a comment, the Marbo case that recognised the Aboriginal link to the land. The head lawyer was Ron Caston. That's right. So he's talking about the, um, the link in Australia between the Jewish community and Aboriginals who have linked um, different cases and been instrumental in helping to gain rights for our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. Sorry, excuse me, I'm just taking a drink. So where were we? We were talking about the fact that in Australia, we have compulsory voting. Compulsory voting? Yes, compulsory voting. You don't vote, you get a fine. It's not a huge fine. It could be, you know, 20 bucks, 50 bucks. But when was the last time you wanted to just give money to the government for not voting? So Americans tell me, that's wild, Nomi. You have a vote for parliament and you must participate. It is compulsory. And I said, well, actually, we end up with a much more normal sort of result. What do I mean by normal? 90% of Australians will, or 85% of Australians will traditionally vote. That's super high. Can you imagine an American election if you've got 85% of all people eligible to vote voting? Wow. So it doesn't end up, why does it end up being a more normal result? Because 
in countries where you do not have compulsory voting, you get two types of people who are more inclined to vote. You get radical people on the right and radical people on the left who feel very, very strongly about politics. They're anti-something, they're pro-something, they feel something deep in their bones. Majority of people in the middle lose hope. They say, oh, nothing's ever going to change. I can't affect anything. Why would I bother to vote? The, 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 the discourse is so toxic. The discourse is so horrible. I'm not going to engage in this. What happens in Australia? Australians know they have to vote. Australians don't want to get fined. They want to be part of the democratic process. So majority of people know who they vote for. Majority of people, even if they wouldn't in other countries be inclined to vote, take their civic responsibility to vote very seriously in Australia. So they'll go to the polls and they're not radical. They're not right. They're not left. They're just, you know, a normal person who cares about having a good life and they'll go and they'll vote. So what does that mean? It means that the result in Australia is not generally radical. It's not right, right, radical or left, left, radical. A lot of people in the middle and the result is somewhere in the middle. So you, you can definitely have swings and it can be sometimes, you know, a big wipeout goes from one party to the other party. And it can be a shock, some of the results. But generally speaking, it's a pretty normal result. You know, you understand a handful of seats that will change and districts that will change hands. Most people will vote. So we all have to vote. We haven't got the exact date, but it will be later this year, probably around October time. A vote will be sent to our houses in the mail. Should Australia add an Indigenous voice to the parliament? Now, I want to talk about you, and it's a yes or no question. And... I want to talk about some of the Jewish values that I think are, are related to supporting people in need. And you can chime in, you can send me a, a, a voice message if you want, or a, a text message um, if you're live, you can tell me. What Jewish values are involved in supporting people in need? So I think that obviously it's Tikkun Olam, a sense of repairing the world. Um, if we want a better society and we want a better world, voting to recognise Indigenous people in our constitution in Australia would be a form of doing that. If historically Aboriginal people weren't able to be recognised, they weren't considered part of society, they didn't have any rights and their communities are still suffering in this incredibly wealthy and successful country, shouldn't we want to make it better for them? Shouldn't we want to make it easier for them to participate and enjoy the bounty of Australia? The voice to parliament is seeking to address the historical marginalisation of these communities by ensuring that their representatives have the opportunity to tell the parliament what they need and whether what the parliament is proposing is a good idea. Another Jewish value that I think is inherent in this referendum is Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof, the pursuit of justice. So in Judaism, we place a really strong emphasis on being fair and being just for all people. So supporting the voice to parliament can be seen as a way of advocating for justice and equal representation for Indigenous Australians who historically have faced disadvantage and inequality. We have as well, I didn't put this one on the slideshow, but I also think we have the Jewish value of lo tignov, you should not steal. If we took Aboriginal people's land, there is a way to recognise them and ensure that we are doing everything we can to support them, especially because taking the, their land caused them such historical issues more than 250 years later, their communities are still struggling. And this is an ancient community that for thousands of years was able to sustain itself successfully and have these beautiful communities. And when we came, it has never been the same for them. Then we have the other one, respect for others. If we want to respect all humanity, we have to support initiatives like the Voice to Parliament because this voice demonstrates a commitment to recognising and honouring the rights and the culture and heritage of Indigenous Australians. So these are some of the Jewish values. I spoke about this. This is how, to, how the referendum in Australia work. I wanted to uh, touch on some of the other critiques of the referendum that have come from within our Jewish community. So 
unfortunately, in Australia at the moment, we have two major parties. We have the Labor Party, which is in charge, and we have the Liberal Party. And Americans um, will laugh because the Liberal Party is our right-wing party, but liberal in America means left-wing. So our Liberal Party has come out very strongly against the voice to Parliament, advising Australians to vote no against it. And if I'm being honest, all the polling right now in Australia indicates that the voice to Parliament is in trouble. It doesn't look like this referendum is actually going to get off the ground, which is a real shame because it's an amazing opportunity to help Indigenous people in Australia. Why, why does our right-wing party, our Liberal Party, not want people to vote yes? I guess it's a few things. One, the referendum is a specific question asking should uh, an Indigenous voice be added to our constitution? If you answer yes, then you obviously would then have some questions following up. How does it work? Who's going to be on that voice? Are they going to be mandatory? Will the government have to listen to them? Will any law have to change if they're not happy? What does the implementation look like? And the government in Australia the left-wing Labor Party, has said, well, we are elected as representatives of Australians. We have a majority of the seats in the current parliament. We will legislate and create laws around the voice to parliament if it is successful. But the Liberal Party, our right-wing party, says, no, nah, not acceptable. Tell us how it's going to work or we are not going to advise our people to vote for it. Now, when it comes down to it, anyone can vote however they like. You can vote, you have a free vote, but because Australians all have to vote in elections and because Australians take their civic responsibility quite seriously, and because most Australians, we have a two-party system here. You have a right-wing party, a left-wing party, and every few years, the government switches between the two of them. So roughly 50% of people will vote for one and 50% of people will vote for the other. We have some minor parties as well. But if one of the two major parties says don't vote for the voice, you've lost an instant massive number of people who listen to their leadership, who said, okay, well, if the, the Liberals, the right-wing party says no, then I'm not going to vote for it. And that makes it complicated because whether the voice and the way that it's being run as a referendum is a good method for Indigenous inclusion, I would answer the following. I would say, I'm not Indigenous. I listen to Indigenous people. And if a majority of Indigenous Australians got together and said, this is what we want, who am I as a Jewish woman living in a city who doesn't ever see Aboriginal people, who am I to tell the majority of Indigenous people that they're wrong for wanting this? I would vote yes, support them. You can vote for it. I hear the critique from the right-wing party that says, but you haven't told us exactly how it's going to work and you haven't told us how, what, what some of the, you know, hidden terms and conditions may be. But I would also answer this. We have a parliament that represents us. If a majority of Australians voted for the current parliament, you have to at least respect that process, which means they are in parliament to write the laws and to govern for this country. I may not like everything the government does and I may not support the government on every single thing, but I also respect that a majority of my fellow Australians voted for them. So they do have a mandate to create laws. So they have, in my opinion, a double mandate. Not only did Indigenous Australians request a voice to parliament, but the current government is elected by a majority of people in the parliament. And who am I to say no? I have spoken with some Jewish groups about this and they remain nervous. Some of the right-wing Jewish groups. And they say, we're not going to vote yes. And I, I ask them, why? Why not? I'm always happy to hear different opinions. Not everyone has to agree with me. And they said, Nomi, historically, Jewish people understand that if there is a differentiation based on race and it's enshrined in law, and if it's in Australia's constitution, becomes very, very challenging to change that. You'd have to hold another referendum. So once it's already in the constitution, you can't change it very easily. And you're effectively, this is what the right-wing argument and from some of the Jewish groups in Australia say, they say, if you 
were to change the law and add an Indigenous voice to Parliament, that means that there's a preferential access to government. It's not clear because we haven't been given the exact terms and conditions of how this voice will interplay with lawmaking in Australia. The government may have to listen to them. We don't know how the government's going to legislate. They're getting preferential access to government based on race, the fact that they are Indigenous. And as Jews, the minute we see that, says the right-wing groups, we get nervous. We get nervous because we don't like race-based laws. And obviously they're invoking a Holocaust, um, or a historical sort of pogroms against Jews uh, ideology. I hear it and I understand. And for people who don't know, Australia has one of the highest numbers of Holocaust survivors who settled in this country. They wanted to get away from Europe. It was really far away, really beautiful, good life. So when they came here, they set up. But Holocaust trauma runs very deep here. Everyone has a grandparent and cousin who survived the holocaust and that's when our community really started to boom so i don't disregard the anxiety that many are feeling and especially acknowledging our deep connection to the holocaust and the fact that we understand that never again means never again but i really think it's a misconstrual of what would happen if we we are recognizing one of the most um, disadvantaged groups in australia we need to help them we're chucking money at a problem that's not working and we need to do it better than we're currently doing. I'm curious to know if anyone here has any opinions as to how they would vote in Australia. Um, I guess it's less, mm, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase. I'm a millennial. Um, so my friends and I talk openly about who we vote for and it's not rude to ask someone, who are you voting for slash how are you voting? Um, I would say my parents, who are boomers, who I love dearly, they don't ask each other necessarily how are you voting, but we just take it for granted as millennials. This is how we're voting. This is what we're doing. Um, so I'm planning to vote yes to add an Indigenous voice to the parliament. Um, I do have a little bit of reservations that we haven't been given the exact mechanism on how it's going to work but I trust in the parliamentary process. So I would vote yes for it, but it's not something that's going along clear party lines. So I'm curious to know how people here would vote. And I'm, I'm very happy um, <laughs> to, to be told you're going to vote no and to hear why you would vote no. I would vote yes. Um, if, if, you know, if I was in, in Australia, I think that, there is, is there's a huge issue with a lot of indigenous pain and trauma. And I think that there's still accountability that hasn't happened. Coming in from an American perspective, and I mean, I myself, I'm not American, I'm actually Mexican and I'm indigenous from, Me from Mexico. Um, I think that there's so much pain and accountability that I think it, it's, it's long overdue to bring back you know, giving accountability and power back to a lot of the indigenous communities and as and specifically the First Nation peoples here, um, in in here in the social justice community here, we we have a saying that um, taxation without representation is theft, and that's something that I I really bring upon here. And then um, I'm also pulling upon uh, from Torah and how more than 36 times we're told how to treat a stranger so to me support for marginalized communities has to be one of the biggest jewish issues um but i could definitely see where a lot of more right-wing communities can come from and understand that but I, for me it would be a no-brainer and i'm i'm like you i would definitely let everybody know who i voted for <laughs> thank you for that eddie um interesting to hear a perspective i think that um the disadvantage of Indigenous people and First Nations people, wherever they are located, is something that many societies are grappling with. Um, I would say that one of the examples that has been somewhat more successful, if you actually look to New Zealand, which is Australia's close neighbour, where they made the settlers, the colonisers of New Zealand, made a treaty with the First Nations people, the Maori people who live there. So um, there's still problems within the Maori community in New Zealand. Um, it's not perfect, but in terms of 
recognition, language, culture, acknowledgement, they're miles ahead of Australia and it's um, a better situation overall. I'd say Australian Indigenous people are really suffering in this country. So we have to do something. Um, and I think it's really special that so many Jewish groups have been within Australia advocating very strongly for a yes vote um, from rabbis, religious groups to community peak communal bodies to our local Jewish federation to some of the more social justice inclined groups saying you can have reservations you can have some questions about it but ultimately you can't do nothing what happens if this fails and at the moment the polling is not looking good in Australia it's looking like it's very tenuous in fact some of the polling that's coming forth says no it's going to fail but I question if it fails what next? Do we give up on our Indigenous people? They're already suffering. They've already got some of the worst outcomes in this country. And if this fails, does it give licence to say, well, we can't help them. Majority of Australians don't want to help them. Or if this fails, I wonder what it sends as a message to their community saying majority of Australians didn't want the voice, which is what your communities had all asked for. I think it will set back the agenda of helping Indigenous people in Australia so far back that I shudder to think what the next steps would be after a failed referendum. Mm. And I think the key to... ...going to affect your community and to date had not been good at providing the required support that your communities need. I briefly touched on this. What should Jewish organisations in Australia do? So I think it's clear what I think um, Jewish organisations in Australia should do, and lots of them are doing it. Um, and that was my presentation. Any questions? Thank comments? you. So, thank you so much, um, Rev Nomi. We have some questions from from the stream. If if that's okay, go um, for it. Uh, somebody's asking if uh, First Nations people have the same rights as everybody else does politically. They do, they do now, yes, as in that was changed. Originally, they weren't allowed to vote. Um, they weren't recognised. They were considered not to be part of Australia. But, yes, in 1967, we fixed that up with our constitutional referendum um, to recognise Indigenous people. Um but there's still problems. It's not, it's not simple to be Indigenous in this country. Thank you. Another question, and this says, coming from an American perspective, has racism played within the conflicts of First Nation people having access to political power? It's a really hard question. I think that there would definitely be some racial elements. Um, how would I say this? I'm just trying to think of the best way to answer it. You definitely have problems of race. Um, Australia has been known for its racism. One of the signature policies in Australia was the white Australia policy, um, which only allowed in the, uh, what would it have been, the 40s, 50s, even 60s, which only allowed white people to immigrate to Australia. So we didn't accept um, black people. A lot of our um, black and brown First Nations people have complaints. Um, there's a lot of investigations into police brutality and higher deaths of custody of Aboriginal people in jail in Australia, um, higher rates of incarceration of Aboriginal people in Australia. So um, race definitely comes into play but I would say there's so much systemic disadvantage that's experienced by the Indigenous community in Australia. Race would be one of the very many factors that is affecting their disadvantage, not the sole factor. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, how do you think that we can work as a Jewish community to better connect our own struggles with the Holocaust to the struggles of Indigenous people, uh, First Nation people in Australia? So there are a lot of um, partnerships with our community and the Indigenous community. But the most important advice I would say is 
we have to listen to First Nations people in every discussion where we want to link and partner with them. We have to hear their voices. We have to hear what they want. We have to hear what's the best way to support them. So I can suggest whatever I want, but ultimately it has to be endorsed and it has to be um, uh, confirmed that this is what Indigenous people in Australia want. I um, We have an amazing program. We have an organisation here called Stand Up. And they send every single year, perhaps even twice a year, a group of young Jews to Indigenous communities. They're not where we live. It's about a two, three hour flight. Uh, Tumala and Bogabilla, they're the communities, Indigenous communities. And you really get a sense that how you're living as a relatively privileged Jewish person in the city, in a really nice area, is not how Indigenous people experience Australia. My friends who have been to this program, they run youth programs and they help to train some of the Indigenous leaders so that they're able to have communities that can self-sustain, that they understand, you know, how to run a youth program for them, for, for other Indigenous children. They train the leadership there. It's been groundbreaking for these communities because instead of coming in and running it for them, you're training a generation of Aboriginal young leaders who are then going to be able to give back to their community. But when you see the state of their towns, that there is lack of health services, food deserts, lack of healthy food, um, really difficult transport options, lack of schools, lack of facilities, lack of after school program, you know, it's just, there's so much that can be done. So work with indigenous people, hear their voices, listen to what they're asking for, and support them best in, in the ways that they're asking through those interactions. Thank you so, so much. I, I love that we're able to connect our work um, here, working with uh, Uri Letzatic prides itself of being able to work with, a lot with the indigenous communities here and um, where we are in, in Arizona, coming into a lot of the, the reservations and um, working together to collaborate on resources on uh, civic engagement and learning how the, the voting system works here, connecting folks to that type of uh, educational power. So it's, it's like really holistic to bring everything together and with a deep grounding in Torah. So I, I really, really appreciate you, Rabbi Nomi, for your time. And good morning to you in, in Australia. And uh, we'll make sure to link up all of your um, your uh, contacts so that if anybody's interested in connecting with you and furthering along the um, information of such a great class today, thank you so much for your time. And I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Thank you for everybody you who's listening. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.